Many critics over the years have argued that this film is Sturge's excuse or justification for his choice of making comedies instead of tragedies. I think that's a mistake. They're confusing Sturge's plot line with what he thinks, as opposed to looking at it as a biography of a film director. What happens in this movie to this character, this film director? Sturge's surrogate, he has to get himself out of all of these jams. It's, he's, he's the only one really interested in grasping the big picture. No one else in Hollywood wants to see it, nor do they believe the common people want to see it. So he must struggle alone, as artists do, to reveal the truth. This is a film about the, uh, the sovereignty of the film director over the studio system. You have to understand that Sturge has spent a lot of his childhood and his early youth growing up in, um, in Europe. His mother was a woman named Mary Desty, who was uh, the traveling companion and perhaps best friend of uh, Isidore Duncan, the great dancer. So Sturge just grew up kind of going to museums and seeing shows. And uh, by the time he was in his uh, late teens, he was a very sophisticated young man. But he also spent a lot of time in, in Chicago with his stepfather, who he, he loved very dearly, who was a, kind of a straight Midwestern banker type uh, who, who was fairly well off, but very conservative. And Sturgis had an appreciation for this. Uh, he didn't come up from the bottom like a lot of directors. He didn't struggle. He, he, uh, he had, uh, in fact, some real failures and uh, some poverty in his life, but, but he, he had kind of an appreciation of the, of the way America worked, a real love for it. Uh, he appreciated the way a man could invent himself in America, that you could just kind of pop up full-blown as this outrageous character and, and, uh, and people would embrace it. Um, that was, uh, as someone said, I think it was James Harvey uh, said at one point, um, it was a time when, when Americans still loved themselves. They loved the people. They loved the diversity. They loved... You know, they loved all of the things that America was and, and they hoped it would become. And, and Sturges really embraced that. So his European wit, his sophistication was allowed to breathe in this kind of American warmth, sentiment, nostalgia that made it uh, both very original for American audiences because they hadn't seen it or they'd seen it coming out of the mouth of a European director who they weren't particularly interested in hearing or understanding his voice. Now, this was all cut when I watched this on TV. It drove me crazy that somebody thought this shouldn't be seen and yet the, all the slapstick... You know, it's it just now neither of them, you know, offend me in the slightest, you know, because listen, you know, funny is funny and real is real. This guy's amazing. This great voice. I guess I don't have to tell you what it is. The sheep kind of gives it away. <laughs> the, the scene in the black church is, is uh, like a few others in, in the film, almost fable like. Again, you have to, to see this as filtered through a very sophisticated European mind who had to know on one level that this was fake. It goes very near the edge of being over the top. And I think Sturges was, was not an unsophisticated man. He knew that he was pushing it very close to the edge. When the film was, was, was first uh, released, it's... it's it's not completely groundbreaking in the sense that there had been other films on Hollywood in, in the past, but there was a certain combination of real life sentiment and irony, which is irony's pretty unique uh, function in, in American films of this period. Now all we have is irony in our movies, but but back then it was it was used very sparingly. Um, but it was the war. And people had real life had really confronted them first by the depression and then a world war. 
there were really issues at stake. Things were things were tough, and um, you had to have a certain uh, sense of humor to get through it. Uh, and and Sturgis uses it throughout this film. The church is actually a very sophisticated miniature set deeply in a stage, and it, it, it works quite effectively. Um, the thing about a very eccentric artist like Preston Sturges is that he really needed the kind of cocoon of a motion picture studio, of having the same gaffers and grips and sound people working with him every day. He, he used only three cameramen through his time at uh, Paramount. Uh, John Seitz, who shot Selvin's Travels, worked on, I believe, three of his films. And, and he, he had a comfort level that allowed him to play. They got into his rhythm. He got into theirs. He was fascinated by what they did. And they, like most people, when you show an interest in what they do, uh, they respond to you. And they responded to Sturgis. He was, he was quite loved and adored uh, on those studio lots by the people who actually made movies, not necessarily by the people who ran the studios, but by the people who made films. And uh, so he, he not only worked with the same group of actors, his famous stock company, the Ale and Quail Club, but he also worked with the same technicians time and time again. And uh, they actually, they brought something to his film, a, a speed and energy. Working on a Preston Sturges set, he would be playing the piano in between takes while they're setting up. It was a wild group, people coming and going, other stars, other directors. A uh, Preston Sturges movie was, to a great extent, like a party. And, it, and it, he managed to keep this, this energy level up for, you know, 30 or 40 days or whatever the shooting schedule was, um, that that was quite unique. It, it, working on a film with him was fun. It was more fun than it was work. There's at least some belief that uh, Sturgis wanted to use a, a Chaplin film in, in place of the Mickey Mouse cartoon, which would have been much more in keeping um, with the whole style and feeling and, and if you will, self-consciousness of the film. The Mickey Mouse cartoon is not maybe as effective as it could be. See, now, when I was 19 years old and, and knew everything, that, that scene appeared forced to me. And now it seems almost perfect. Jeez, I hope it's not the deterioration I keep hearing is going to happen. I hope I'm getting better. <laughs> Am I laughing? Got a great quote from Victor Borga, which works at the end of this movie, maybe not now. But he said that laughter is the shortest distance between two people. And if the responsibility of the artist is to make connections and to communicate, then, I don't know, it's, it's as legitimate as anything else. And that's his audience. <laughs>